Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners policy session on January 18, 2023. Gary Schmidt, what's up first? Thank you, Chair Smith. Your first policy session today, Commissioners, is Additional Recycling Services. Our staff from Transportation and Development, Sustainability and Solid Waste Division will present our presenters to start, Dan Johnson, Director of Transportation and Development, and Cheryl Bell, Assistant Director of Transportation and Development. Go ahead, please. This chair gets shorter every time I'm up here. <laughs> uh, chair Smith, Commissioners, uh, thank you so much for the time this morning. Um, we are reporting back to you. Um, harken back to August 3rd, we had a discussion around how to advance an original request uh, from Whit Ridwell, um, but how to advance that request through our current um, franchise system, essentially how to expand service. The direction the board gave us was to part, continue to partner with our service providers, um, was to continue to look at options for consideration. Um, those options have been developed, and we're here to share this with you today. Um, I want to emphasize the fact that when we're discussing this, um, these are additional recycling or expanded recycling services. They are optional. You opt into the service. If you opt into the service, then there is a fee for it, but you have the personal ability to opt in for the service. It's not a mandatory service that we're providing. Um, this matter is brought before the board um, uh, and county code, as county code restricts collection of solid waste um, for a fee to a franchise collector and to meet the desires of some residents uh, for convenient at-home recycling of additional materials. These are like, for Commissioner West benefit, these are like clamshells and things of that nature, okay? Um, we're here to share this with you. Um, this is basically advancing the path that you set us down. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Cheryl Bell and she'll go into some more detail regarding this particular proposal. Welcome, Cheryl. Good morning, Chair Smith, and good morning, Commissioners. So following the direction given by the board in August, staff worked with our collectors to develop a program which is proposed to be named Recycle Plus and the necessary administrative rules to govern the program. So as proposed and outlined in the issues worksheet, Recycle Plus will be an optional program available to residential customers living in the urban fee zone and offered by the franchise collector that's currently serving the customer right now. The service would provide optional collection every other week on an on-call basis for um, plastic film and bag clear clamshell takeout containers, compact fluorescent bulbs, and textiles suitable for rags. And Recycle Plus would provide intermittent collection of additional items for use in recycling, like light, um, holiday lights or other seasonal items that could be co uh, collected occasionally. The program will use Far West Recycling, an independently operated material recovery facility, to receive the materials and transfer them for recycling processing. So we've already identified somebody to take the materials being collected. It's important to note that the initial program will be for customers in the urban fee zone as to date all demand for this service has originated in this area of the county. If approved for operation, we'll monitor demand for these services in the rural fee zones and develop a program to serve these areas in the future. So for customers to use this optional subscription-based service, a new fee is proposed to cover the associated cost. Subscribers would pay a monthly fee of $2.50 to cover the cost of a new 20 gallon bin that will be provided to customers and other administrative costs. Then when a customer requests a collection for materials, they pay a collection fee. And this collection fee is, um, considers the cost of labor, of processing the recyclables, investment in and operating of the trucks and equipment necessary to provide the service directly. These fees are in your packet and they range from $9.25 to $13 per pickup, depending on how far the collection bin is located from the curb. When considering the cost, it's important to remember if a customer doesn't wish to use this optional service, there is no change to their fees. So it is completely optional. In addition to Recycle Plus, we'd like to add an additional service that would be for all customers in the county. When we were researching and developing Recycle Plus, we found we can also accept um, household batteries, so alkaline, lithium, and rechargeable batteries in our weekly curbside recycling for all rural, mountain, and urban fee zones in the county. If approved today, batteries could be added to collection effective immediately upon board approval and with no increase to fees. So free battery pickup for everybody, no, no increase to the fees. This proposal not only offers a new service to recycle battery components, but it's really about safety because there's concerns about fires in our garbage trucks and in our collection facilities. In fact, we did have a fire occur on one of our, you know, one of our trucks on our routes based to commingling 
poor commingling of batteries. So it's really about safety too. This proposal is modeled after a successful program um, developed in Marion County and already operating in Washington County and City of Gresham. And customers would be instructed to place batteries in a sealed plastic bag and put the sealed bag in the glass bin for collection. So the Solid Waste Commission that serves as the county's formal advisory body reflecting public participation in managing solid waste met on September 28, 2022 to review the additional recycling program and the fees proposed by staff. And the commission voted 4-0 to um, recommend adoption of the program and the proposed fees. The commission also voted 4-0 to recommend the collection of household batteries and weekly residential solid waste collection service. And with a 4-0 vote, approved proposed amendments to the solid waste collection services administrative regulations in order to provide these programs. So that brings us to the options for the board today. Option one is to direct staff to prepare a board order for an upcoming business meeting to begin implementing the additional recycling collection service or Recycle Plus and adopt the proposed fees. Option two is to direct staff to implement the addition of curbside household battery recycling with no fee increase um, to the weekly solid waste collection service. Option three, direct the DTD department director <laughs> to amend administrative rules supporting these programs. And option four, suggest an alternate policy direction. So respectfully, staff are recommending options one, two, and three to bring both Recycle Plus and free battery recycling to our community. And if the board supports these recommendations, staff request to bring this item before the board on consent agenda. So we are excited about Recycle Plus and free batteries, and we would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for bringing this back. I think it's very well done. Um, I think it's time that we you know, make a decision on this and move forward. Um, I have some questions. Um, you said is this, you said it was urban services, but then you alluded to uh, mountain services and so forth. So for instance, on the base charge billed monthly at 250, is that in the entire collection area of the private haulers? This, it, would, it would be for Recycle Plus area only, which is the urban fee zone, and that 250 per month would be for somebody who signs up for the optional Recycle Plus program. Okay, so for instance, this is not available to um, areas outside, for instance, between uh, Malala, Estacada, Sandy area, correct? Because obviously they're not urban. Correct. Yeah. It's you, what is the area? What is the urban area? The plus recycle plus fee, recycle plus area. Do you have a map for that? Is it in here? We don't have one, but we can provide one for yeah, you. Yeah, we can get that for urban you. Urban boundary and limitations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's two dollars and fifty cents a month for how many times to pick up? Weekly, monthly. No. The 250 covers the base cost of just administrative and getting your actual collection bin and the materials that you would. Put sort into, and then when you call for a collection, a pickup, there's that um, collection fee, and it um, runs from nine dollars and twenty-five cents okay. to thirteen dollars. I'm just, I, I see this here, but I'm just. Yeah, it's a good I'm question. Just trying to, because you know, you look at a bunch of fees, and they say, oh, somebody, oh, a base charge, I can do it, you know, for two dollars and fifty cents a month. Oh, but by the way, there's these other fees that are tacked on, which I'm totally fine with. Um, commissioners, gee. Mm -hmm. It's like Christmas lights have lit up. <laughs> Commissioner Savas, you're up. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm good with this action. Um, great work, and I'm glad that everyone got together and uh, came to agreement on this. Uh, for my, what I've been hearing related to the topic of recycling and services, especially in the rural area, more so than the urban area, but, you know, I, I have a, apparently an ADU on my property uh, where the raccoons are living, I say that jokingly, <laughs> and uh, so they're 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 making a heck of a uh, heck of a mess of things. But I can certainly understand when I'm listening to people up on the mountain, and I know that some coastal communities have have these heavier duty. I guess they're calling them bear proof containers um, oh. for pickup. And um, you know, I'm not saying I really need that right now per se. Um, we've tried to we took a couple of precautions to, or adjustments. Uh, with how we deal with things right now to put them in an area where the raccoons don't really seem to want to go. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering if, if there can be a discussion in the future about, about that, um, I, see if that is an option. I know it's got to be a little bit more, uh, I understand it might be a little bit more cumbersome because the equipment might not be geared or designed to pick it up. 
So I would like to look into that because we're having a lot of complaints. Um, you know, I've been hearing on the mountain, especially uh, with bears and other critters getting into and creating havoc, creating havoc. And once they realize there's food to be found in those in those containers, they're back for more. So um, that's that's just something to look into. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll take that back, and staff will work together and get back to you. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to go down the line, Commissioners. Uh, maybe, Commissioner Scholl, you want to start? Certainly. You know, I like the idea of a 250 a month charge for the bin and then an on-call pickup, which could happen, you know, once every six months, or maybe once a year. So that's, I like the efficiency and the cost in that. Uh, the Far West Recycling Center. Is that going to be the central recycling center for this uh, initiative? Yes, it will okay. be. Okay. And where's that located? I'm going to look to staff here for a minute. Yeah. Northeast Portland. Northeast, Northeast Portland. Portland. Okay. And it, now, is Far West Recycling and Ridwell one and the same? No, they're not. They're far, far West is a materials management facility, and Got they it. take all sorts of materials yeah. from different um, different haulers, different places, right. and manage the materials. It, uh, right, okay. And so uh, in this, it, if Ridwell is authorized then to be franchised to do this service, do they then subcontract with another company to do the actual curbside pickup? With the adoption of Recycle Plus, we would not be offering a license to Ridwell in the county. Okay. All right. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner West. Good morning. Good morning. We'll, we'll try to fix that chair. <laughs> <laughs> We're listening. Is there a calcium deficiency or what it is? <laughs> but it is good comic relief in these meetings. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, thank you for this presentation. This is, uh, this is fantastic. I do just have a... A couple questions and clarification points, um, uh, kind of along the lines of what Chair Smith brought up here. Uh, when I'm looking, maybe just I missed it or I'm not totally understanding it. When I look at the fee schedule, it starts with uh, um, the 250. You know, I'm guessing curbside collection each. That's I make a request to have it picked up. I'm not understanding exactly collection five to 150 feet each or collection over one. Are these like couches? I mean, are like a bunch of like, are a bunch of gar like construction? I don't, I don't understand what, is that like where the people live? Can you explain that to me? Sure, um, and if, if I misspeak, I'll let staff kind of okay. ping me here. Um, it's where the bin will be actually um, distance from the curbside. So if it's right at the curb, if you think of a very urban environment, you set it right at the curb and, and there's no need to send um, a staff person to go up and pick it up. If some of our areas where people have long driveways and it's up at the house and you're traveling 150 feet, there's an additional charge to pick up the bin at the, at the front of the house because someone's gonna have to jump off the truck, run up there, get the bin, bring it back and dump totally. it. So okay. that's where the fee, it's the distance from the actual curb itself. Okay, I think we have a lot of that in Clackamas County. So and if I could expand sense. on that just briefly, yeah. that's a good point because I'm gonna, it ties in with the chair's question, which is about the fact that these are urban services to begin, but there will be tracking of this service and the possibility to expand it. Um, that Cheryl noted that. And so this fee structure contemplates that, so. Um, question also, when I look at materials collected, I see like, Difficult, okay, is this basically, because I know the plastics have been, recycling those have been a, a challenge, even on the market, right? And some of these like more difficult, obscure types of plastic, like a bread bag is, is, is not, has been difficult. Um, so is this all fluorescent lights was one of my questions or, so if a business is or commercial, they wanna participate in a program to like replace their fluorescent or LD, LED lights, is that part of this or is this? Am I, sorry. <laughs> We're bringing up the materials okay. management expert. Uh, this is, I know right now that this would be residential only and not a business okay. recycling program so that um, there's, there's definitely ways to recycle for businesses and that's what our staff does quite a bit of and we'd happy to help a business do their recycling. Okay. But this is residential only. Okay. And it is, so right now it's very much limited to these specialty items 
Batteries are free, am I correct? So anybody right now can put in a special bag, their AA batteries, and put it just in their glass bin. That's and correct. And it will automatically be recycled. Is that also just the urban area, or is that available to everybody in the county? That's a good question. Um, if approved, the battery recycling would be for everybody in the county. So that would be added to the regular collection services for all of our customers. The specialty items like the compact fluorescent bulbs, the clamshells, and the plastic film would just for be for people who choose to sign up for Recycle Plus. Okay. Um, and do we, nothing, nothing in this is including stuff that are difficult to deal with, like styrofoam? That's correct. Is that correct? Is yeah. that, that's a whole other beast? That's a whole other thing. Okay. We do collection events occasionally, though, to pick up, to pick up styrofoam, and we um, work with a lot of other events to make sure we have those opportunities, opportunities. in the community. Um, and then what is the outreach to, this is whole new, right? So what's the outreach, and how do we get people to buy, where, how do we get the buy-in, and what's the plan around that? That's a good question, and I think, Rick, I'm going to pass that to you, because you've been working please on that. Please introduce yourself. Yes, please. Um, Morning, commissioners, and welcome, Commissioner West. Uh, Rick Winterhalter with uh, Office of Sustainability and Solid Waste. And we are working on a promotion uh, program that mimicking what Washington County did, essentially. So we have some postcards that will be going out kind of in a couple months. We're going to do kind of a slow um, launch, but we have interested parties that have been emailing us and that sort of thing. And so we will make notice of that. Um, as much as we can. The collectors will be reaching out. We'll have things on our websites. And so we will continue to kind of reach out to folks in that way. And mm -hmm. Will this be in the county publication that we send out to Clackamas County residents? We contemplated campaign? that. The difficulty with that, Commissioner, is that that, that reaches everybody. And this program oh, oh. is kind of limited to the urban area for now. You know, um, so that's so right now we're kind of leaving that off and doing more direct mailing to the customers uh, that do we can have buy-in from our local municipalities like Wilsonville, Lake Oswego, and whatnot? Because I know they do, like Wilson, we do the Boone's Ferry Messenger that goes out to that th those regions, partnering with them to see if we can get space or local papers to do outreach on this just to let people know. Good question, Commissioner. That's a good question. I think we'll also be working with public and government affairs to do a good um, broad okay. outreach, and they're already aware. And um, We've already brought in staff. One of the other great things about Recycle Plus, it's already active in Washington County, Beaverton, and Sherwood, and other cities. So um, we have the ability to draw on some of their marketing materials and their ideas of how they Perfect. got the word out. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Yeah. And <clears throat> I like what you said. Um, about a countywide publication, I would like to see this program up and running before we start beating the drum and saying, oh, we're here. It needs to be tested and uh, work out any possible kinks, and there may not be any kinks, so I would be uh, use your own discretion on that. Uh, Commissioner Schrader. Yes, I just had to let Commissioner Savas know that I have big fat raccoons uh, in my accessory <laughs> dwelling unit. They're as big as my fat Pomeranian. It's terrible. It's really scary. Well. I know. <laughs> but I have, other than that, I have a battery question. So is this going to include, like, you know, as we're moving into new technologies with automobiles, battery powered, is this going to include recycling for those? I mean, you're talking about the small batteries you put in but not the big stuff yet. Yeah, so it is just for the small batteries for right now. Okay. But um, it's a good question and something I think everybody in the industry is looking at because... We, we need to think about that if we're moving from one, you know, there's always going to be some waste and, and impact on the environment. So I was just curious if anybody had been, been thinking about that. Yet, uh, and uh, that actually, that was all I really needed to know. I think this is great work. Thank you so much for doing it. Good to see you, Rick. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, uh, when you said clamshells, that triggered a memory here, a recent one. And I was, what I believe was over the Christmas holiday, could have been even more recent than that, but uh, was watching a piece on the news and there was a piece I think it was Metro that Metro did it was a Metro staffer talking about waste recycling and so forth and talking about the confusion of plastics okay mm -hmm. and basically I, I guess if I was to wrap it up in the narrative I think the message that I received was um, if it's not recyclable we'll throw it in the garbage right so clamshells includes that right mm -hmm. um, so I, I have a well I have this opportunity I just want to make sure that's clear because I've heard, you know, 
during the, during the summer, I heard from some people that were advocating for services that, oh no, you can't put clamshells, that's irresponsible, put clamshells in the garbage, and there's no place to take them. There's no one taking them. So that's, well, whether it's a myth or not, I'm here to kind of do that. The other one is, it's come up, is also corrugated plastic. <coughs> now, an example of corrugated plastic are campaign signs, for example, right? People want to get rid of them, and they don't stop mine. It blew in my neighborhood. Where do I, what do I do? How do I recycle it? So have at it. I can do clamshells. I'm going to give you corrugated. Uh, so clamshells, clamshells, um, you are correct that if you do not have a program like Recycle Plus, um, to do them at your curbside is currently not available. It's not collected curbside unless you have a Recycle Plus. So if somebody didn't want to take it to another place to recycle it, they, it, it is best to throw it out because the more clean we keep the stream of the recycling, it's really important for the value of the recyclables and the safety of the workers resorting the material. Um, if there are places where you can directly take your clamshell um, containers and drop them off as an independent person for free. So a number of marketplaces do now take clamshells, and so you can do that. Okay, okay we need to finish this up. <clears throat> Thank you, commissioners. So just one thing, Chair, the corrugated yeah. plastic, just to touch on that. Oh, yeah. There are places to do corrugated plastic, but if for a campaign that has a lot of those, so that we can find ways to get rid of that, but that's kind of on a one-off basis. Mm. Okay. Can you just email me? I absolutely will. Thanks. That's a good question, Paul. Uh, also on clamshells, usually you're talking about the styrofoam clamshells. I've also noticed restaurants restaurants converting to the more paper version. Yeah. And um, if I could encourage the businesses who use styrofoam, Clamshells, there is an alternative that does not pose a problem for um, garbage collection or recyclables. And uh, I really like them. Yes. Commissioners, any further questions? I will entertain a motion. And they're written out for us on the bottom of page three. I will entertain a motion that supports the options listed one, two, and three. So move. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Commissioner Schrader has moved that we direct staff to prepare a board order for an upcoming business meeting to begin implementing the additional recycling collection service, Recycle Plus, and to adopt the proposed fees to direct staff to implement the addition of curbside household batteries recycling with no fee increase to the weekly solid waste collection service. Three, direct the DTT department director to amend administrative rules supporting these programs. Commissioner Scholl has second the motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Tony, please take the poll. Commissioner Scholl. Aye. Commissioner Savitz. Aye. Commissioner West. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank, Thank you, you very Chair. much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye. Gary, what's up next? Your next policy session is the Neighborhood, neighborhood Livability Project Update. This is an informational update that you had requested previously, commissioners. Uh, presenters come from our Trans Department of Transportation and Development, the Cal Clackamas County Sheriff's Office, the Clackamas County District Attorney's Office, County Council, a whole stream of folks. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll start with you, Scott Seco, Assistant County Council. Will you kick it off and introduce everyone as they come up, please? Yeah, sure, good morning. Uh, Administrator Schmidt, uh, commissioners, Scott Seco from County Council. And I am proud to be here today talking about uh, what has been one of the most rewarding uh, pieces of my career here in Clackamas County, which is the Neighborhood Livability Project. Uh, and for those of you who are either new or haven't uh, heard of it or haven't been reminded of it in a, quite a while, that's what we're here to do. Neighborhood Livability Project is basically a group of uh, interdepartmental employees. So we have several departments from throughout the county that came together nearly 10 years ago to address some of the most difficult, most problematic, uh, kind of biggest nuisance properties throughout the county. And what we were finding at the time was that we had a lot of different departments looking at each of these properties in their own kind of silo. They were each using their own tools independently trying to address the problems that were happening there. And 
really kind of common sense, sensically, we came together to form this group in order to open communication, to manage our resources more efficiently, and to think creatively about different ways to approach these properties. So today, there's actually four of us who are going to present, although we have two seats here and two microphones, so we're gonna to try to uh, manage the logistics there. But sitting with me, I have from the Clackamas County District Attorney's Office, Bill Stewart, who has played an integral role. Uh, behind me, I have Lieutenant Tony Killinger from the Sheriff's Office. Uh, they're uh, also a key player. And then Michelle Ammon from Code Enforcement from DTD. And so these are the folks we'll be presenting. And it seems like, uh, to give you kind of a context of where we came from and, and what we do, we have one property that kind of started this all off, and this was on Risley, and this happened back in 2013, 14, and 15. And we have a, a bit of a visual aid here, and Bill Stewart is gonna walk you through the history of how we got started and <coughs> what, this pro, uh, what this particular property involved. Uh, so good morning again. My name is Bill Stewart. I'm a deputy district attorney with Clackamas County. Uh, the Risley House, also known as the Risley Hotel on social media back in the day. Um, <clears throat> I first heard about it, I think in 2014, I was in a meeting with the sheriff's office and someone told me, this is the worst house in Clackamas County. And I actually started laughing. I said, right, right. Well, uh, when uh, my partner, Sarah McClurg, who's here, with, she's with the sheriff's office, actually shared me, with me some of the numbers up there, I was shocked about how bad this place is. The sheriff's office had been there on average three days a week. Uh, they had multiple drug uh, arrests. I'd actually prosecuted some of those folks from those drug arrests, but I hadn't connected the, uh, the house uh, address. And so um, <clears throat> the no garbage service, multiple court enforcement complaints doesn't do it justice. They had a burnt out RV in the backyard where they had thrown their trash into it over probably six months to a year. Uh, rats were, during the summer, were crawling over it and crawling into neighbor's yards. It was an embarrassment. Uh, it was what we started calling zombie house. It, had, it was uh, on a reverse mortgage. The owner had died. There was no will. It was just stuck. We had, a, quite frankly, a son who was in control of the property. And to make money, he was renting spots out. Mm. And so if we can go to the next slide. I remember that, by the way, from the last time I was a commissioner. Um, Everything you said went kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Yes. Uh, no, I, this is a picture you can't, I can't, you really can't see. It's the inside of the house. Um, I could not bring myself to go in. I have a real strong gag reflex, so I stayed out on the kickout day, but it was a disaster. <clears throat> and every time SO went to the door and did a knock and talk, they had made arrests. There were people on warrant status, that type of thing. Next slide, please. More, more uh, images of the inside. Another slide, please. That's the burnout RV I was referring to. Um, it was hard to look neighbors in the face, and um, they would tell you their horror stories about not letting their children in the front of their house or on the back deck. Uh, so next slide, please. I hate to look at that one. So um, this is one of the drug raids they did. Again, we would arrest these folks. We would prosecute these folks. They would quickly go back. We didn't solve the problem. Um, and when we first sat down and had the conversation, we realized all of us, as Scott said, were working on this, but we hadn't made an impact. We hadn't made the community safer. We hadn't improved livability. Next slide, please. So we pulled together a group, and we just started talking about how can we go after this thing. And so essentially, we just started to focus and brought uh, the group together, code enforcement, county council, the sheriff's office. Um, Scott was part of that conversation. We quickly realized we had to shut the place down. And so uh, Scott's uh, work uh, to do that, uh, the chronic nuisance ordinance was a key part. We were stitching together probations on folks saying they could have no contact. Uh, we had success on uh, 2015. Next slide, please. I don't know if it says the date. Um, next slide, please. So it was, uh, I don't remember the exact date, but we had kickout date. And we literally shut the house down and um, the one regret I have on that day was we had about six or eight people who, while, while half the sheriff's office was there closing the place down and boarding it up and, and closing it down, um, they just walked down the street with their backpacks. And so, because there, there were no warrants on them, they, we had no ability to hold them, but I was realizing, wait a second, we just pushed those people to another spot uh, this is a great success. Uh, by the way, this is what the Risley House looked like after a developer came in and, and it, it made it beautiful. We had folks in the neighboring properties telling us that 
they were overjoyed that we had done what we had done. So after that, we realized, hey, we this was a lot of fun. We got we <laughs> to do this more. I mean, I was really proud of it. And so the group came together and we started meeting, I think, on a monthly basis. But this is, this is where it all started here at the Risley Place. Excellent, excellent. And the, the Risley property really exemplifies the types. I mean, it's an extreme for sure, but it's not alone. This was at the time literally, uh, the Oregonian wrote an article and they called it the worst house in Clackamas County. Uh, but it's, it's not the only one. There, were, there have been others that have, been, that have rivaled this that maybe haven't got the, the media attention. Um, the, just so you know, it, it, Risley does exemplify, though, a couple criteria, a couple characteristics of the properties that we deal with. And generally, just for your information, what those generally consist of are crime, and Lieutenant Killinger is going to talk about that in just a moment, but, but a lot of police calls, that's going to be a characteristic of an NLP property. There's going to be a code enforcement aspect of it, solid waste, not proper permitting, uh, occupied RVs, things of that nature are going to often be there. You're going to have angry neighbors. So again, this isn't every house where there's a police call or every house that has a code enforcement issue. This is going to have a combination of these criteria. So angry neighbors having a, a, a negative impact on the neighborhood. Uh, oftentimes, there's, as Bill referenced, there's not clear ownership. Something has happened, somebody's died, something's moved on, and title hasn't formally passed, and so people are just kind of living there. Somebody probably has title, maybe a bank, maybe, but nobody's actively owning, actively, actively managing it. Um, and so these are properties where just one department isn't going to be able to solve it, and it requires that working together. Uh, so with that kind of introduction and description, also want to mention that with the materials we submitted is some excerpts from the monthly report that the Neighborhood Livability Project, actually someone uh, from the DA's office puts that report together every month, and it lists uh, the numbers of properties we're dealing with. And I think, Tony, if you can move ahead, there is going to be some slides. This is just a, obviously a bar graph, but this shows currently what we're looking on. This is our most recent report. We have one, only one priority property that we're working on. We have one new property that we're examining that's been brought to our attention. We have four active properties that we're working on. Uh, one property in review, which means we're not quite ready to close it out. We're kind of keeping an eye on it just in case. But the big number here, and this is what we're really proud of, is uh, nearly 200 closed properties. So we have literally addressed visited, dealt with nearly 200 properties throughout the county and got them to a point where uh, these problems are, for the most part, or for the, you know, the, 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 the large part, entirely resolved. Neighbors are happy, calls are down, uh, code violations are down, things of that nature. So uh, that's what the properties are. That's how many of them we've been dealing with. And Lieutenant Killinger now is here to talk specifically about the Sheriff's Office role in all of this. Good morning, uh, Lieutenant Tony Killinger with the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. Uh, I was asked to kind of just give an overview of what the Sheriff's Office role is on the NLP program. Um, so I'll try to make it short as I can. Uh, usually these pro uh, properties or locations are identified through the Sheriff's Office, either from proactive patrols from deputies who are responding to the same location over and over again, um, through neighborhood complaints. Uh, community Service House McClurg attends a lot of community meetings, so she gets a lot of information straight from the citizens as far as issues they're seeing in their neighborhood, so she brings those to us as well. Um, so once we get one of these locations that we've identified as a potential NLP property, um, we'll bring up calls for service and kind of look at a history of that location and see just the kind of resources, the kind of calls we've been getting. Sometimes it's very few, sometimes we have a whole bunch that are on the board. Uh, we then bring it to our neighborhood livability meeting, um, which involves, you hear from the DA's office, uh, people from the civil department, um, code enforcement, and make sure that nobody else has any open cases or any open projects going with this location. Uh, we usually assign a deputy to that property so that they have a point of contact. So if they're reaching out to the neighbors uh, around the property or they're dealing with the homeowners or the landlord, um, they have a point of contact to go to instead of talking to a different deputy every time they have a question or they want to try to get something taken care of. Um, and then we use all of our resources available if it's uh, a code issue, uh, if it's a law enforcement issue where there's laws that are being violated. Uh, we just look at all these different resources. Uh, what we've seen lately is a lot of them have gone from locations being like a house or a residence to uh, encampments or RV issues on the side of the street where we have to deal with those totally different than we would if it was a residence or a home um, or a business. Um, so that's kind of just the general overview of how we handle those from the sheriff's office standpoint. Um, the benefit for us is having more tools in our toolbox to deal with instead of just uh, law enforcement alone. 
Um, we can reach out to code enforcement and bring them on board. They can do things that we can't. Um, we can offer resources. So if we're dealing with a homeless encampment, we can try to get them resources to get them off the road instead of just arresting them to try to get them off the road, that kind of thing. So that's in general, uh, the sheriff's office, how we handle uh, NLP properties. Short and sweet. Um, this program is just absolutely wonderful. I'm so appreciative of it. I love the work. I remember the Risley House, holy cow. Um, yeah, that's a big success. Also in the packet, uh, you have properties located in certain areas, uh, three areas. One is identified River Road area, Johnson Creek, Jenny's Lodge. Now, are these more what we consider urban, unincorporated Clackamas County? Yeah, the majority in the past of our homes have been in more urban areas. We're seeing a lot more of our properties now expanding out to the rural areas, which create a whole bunch of different challenges for us. Because I do know through. of some properties in the rural areas that um, the citizens and neighbors have been extremely frustrated with. And so that's important as well. So what is the budget for this effort? I see a lot of different departments here lending assistance. And I know this isn't free. And so are you using your existing resources and time? That's an important question, Gary. And Gary, I know you don't like staff to come before the board, but this is a very important, successful program. And uh, it is being done on, I believe, uh, your shoulders and staff time. So do you have a budget? So I think actually, it's good that Lieutenant Killinger is here. The Sheriff's Office is, is perhaps unique in this and that they actually do have some dedicated funds for the Neighborhood Livability Project. Uh, and Lieutenant can talk more specifically about that. But for the, based on what I could find out uh, in advance of this, the rest of the departments essentially are just using their staff time. This is kind of a collateral duty. So mm -hmm. for, for example, my time is not any different when I'm advising on the Neighborhood Livability Project as it would be if I'm advising other departments on other issues. And I think that's, uh, you know, I, I suspect that's... Same, same for the right district right attorneys now. and um, code compliance and that type of thing. Chair, may I, may I answer this question too? This is funded by the general fund commissioners. Mm -hmm. And so the question, uh, this is a, another budget decision you will make. This is not a mandated service of Clackamas County government, but it's really important and it's made a positive difference. Mm -hmm. So do you want to continue spending general funds or not? That's a discussion when you have budget. But mm -hmm. most of it is general funds. There's some marijuana state dollars that the sheriff's office is spending, which is not general funded. Mm -hmm. uh, we have commissioners who want to speak, and I'm just going to go down the line. Commissioner Scholl, would you like to start? Yes, good morning. We have uh, many properties in the county that are in violation of county code when it comes to cleanliness and the use of the property. Um, what actions are required or needed to bring a property to your NLP chart on a new, on your new project column? It, it's really, we, we take, uh, tips or, uh, we take that information from wherever it comes from, whether it's neighbors, whether it's from commissioners, if they have properties that you'd like us to investigate, whether it's from... Uh, sheriff's deputies are code enforcement. So if, if you have specific properties, please okay. put them in contact with myself, with Lieutenant, anybody here that's presenting, and or we can take a look. DDT code enforcement? Sure. One Absolutely. of the three? Absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, not every project uh, problem out there is bad as a Risley project. I'm just getting rid of that motor home with the trash in it. I'm sure it costs somebody in excess of $5,000. Um, what does it cost, okay, for a project, a problem, like the Risley problem, what was the cost of the county to get that taken care of to the point where it could actually be sold to a builder developer? <clears throat> In the case of the Risley house, the cost of the county would have been primarily the staff time. In that case, we filed a chronic nuisance lawsuit, so there would have been uh, some relatively small court costs associated. Uh, with it, but primarily, and, and perhaps Bill's memory is, is better than mine, but I think primarily the cost of that were by the owner, the bank that ended up owning the property, the developer that ended up investing money into the property, who then presumably recouped those costs when they sold the property in its updated, cleaned up uh, uh, status. Okay, one final question. Um, when we look at the cost to the county on taking care of these projects, is there 
a, a, a fine? Was there a fine levied on the Risley House? Yeah, and, and Michelle Amon is here, and she can certainly speak to fines. And, well, I don't need to know numbers, but I'm just curious as if when you have a pro uh, problem house like this, does a fine help offset the cost of time, county time? The short answer with fines is they're always going to be level, levied on these properties. They are rarely end up being paid. So right. there are cases where through foreclosure we can get paid off, but generally there's a priority of we, we have a lien on the property when there's a fine. It depends on our priority in comparison to other lien holders and how much money is gained from the sale, et cetera. So fines are levied. They're rarely collected, I would say, in my experience. Well, if you can't afford monthly garbage pickup, I guess you want to be able to afford the fine. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Tony, can you roll up the screen? Yes, Madam Chair. We'll wait for that to roll up. <coughs> Well, I, I just learned about this program because I did a ride along with one of your deputies. Um, and he spent, he worked overtime to do the NLP work, I think is what happened because we were there for 14 hours. So I think that's four hours longer than his normal shift. And um, he talked to me about this program, he pointed out houses to me. This is where we saw an improvement. Um, this is where we're working on it. We got to go look over here because we're making sure this community is okay. Um, I uh, had no idea that the level of success was this astonishing. I cannot think of another program as a city councilor or as just a concerned citizen, like off the top of my head, that has got these results. This is outstanding. This is like, this is like I'm a little bit floored, to be honest, because I'm looking at the numbers and you look like functional zero almost. There's like what, like a handful of houses left from like I mean, 200 properties. I mean, this is I, this is why my family moved to Clackamas County. This is absolutely a model. I don't know what other counties are doing, but I mean, you're doing it right. I'm, I'm absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm like this is like I'm gonna I like legitimately have chills. I don't mean to be weird about it, but this is fantastic. Um, I, uh, God, um, closed 191 problem properties. Um, it, it, does this program at all include RVs? Because when I did my ride along, there's still an issue with abandoned or homeless like RVs. Like, and I know that's a problem with like funding and getting those things. I know it's a whole nother beast. We do have a program for that. For that, okay. We are working on that sometimes. But this isn't overlaying that. There's a lot of overlap, in fact, okay. and, and this is one of the things on my uh, bullet points to talk about is kind of where the NLP is going, because to your point, Commissioner West, we are, we have had so much success, you know, we're almost in at risk of working ourselves out of a job here for NLP stuff. So um, as we're having success with these properties, we are expanding into things, you know, such as RVs, whether mm -hmm. occupied or abandoned, each of which pose their own unique set of challenges. Uh, large encampments, things of that nature. There's been some issues at some motels, hotels, different types of properties throughout Clackamas County. So we're exploring now how to expand and address those properties as well. Would it also be a natural expansion? I was on D Street. Um, There's a big fenced up <coughs> spray painted property. There's a guy in like a, a truck with like an RV camper on the back of it with a semi-permanent deck. Um, he came out and chatted with us for a while just for discretion. I won't use his name, but he, he was, he chatted with us. Like, I guess he's been there a long time, but there's needles everywhere. There's like, it's, it's like full third world up and down D street and I, and right in our County. And so would this potentially be an opportunity to get what the necessary resources to help address that type of situation also, um, or. I'm just trying to like think like where like I, I think you're doing your job right if you do work yourself out of a job because we want to solve problems that's the goal right, um, and so I, I just kind of had like and you think I think maybe it does by the by you nodding your head that it's a good fit, um, uh, I I th thank you like way to not be in silos way to work together way to do it on a on a dime and make that dollar stretch and to, and to bring solutions to us I I'm 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 super impressed thank you. 
Thank you. We do have an abandoned RV removal program that is somewhat funded, probably not at 100 percent, but a lot of times people uh, think a, an RV is abandoned when it's not. It's actually occupied. So that's a little bit of a different nuance there, but thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Commissioner Schrader, you're up. Yeah, great job, you guys. In fact, I'm hopeful that uh, this model can be used by other departments, particularly as we deal with housing crisis and uh, that nexus between the built environment to, to have people have a spot as well as the social service integration that needs to happen. Uh, your model can be used across the spectrum. And uh, to uh, my fellow commissioner's point, mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner West, uh, have you folks ever presented or applied for a National Association of County Awards for this program? These are the kinds of things that pe public and government relations should know about, and uh, you'd probably get best in show, <laughs> really, okay? <laughs> and, and it's important because when we have these functional models, um, our county has a history of sharing this stuff nationally with them, and uh, you know we got a whole bunch of things. And this program is uh, a perfect uh, uh, candidate for that kind of. So, Gary, I, I think we need to. We've look already at we've already received an award for this. We've applied several years ago. Yes. It was. Oh gosh. Yep. It's already done. Well, just, I've just been here. Well, apply again. They'll probably forget. <laughs> okay, well, well, tell them you're doing more because here's the other piece that I wanted uh, to mention. Uh, are you? What is your role in working with your other fellow law enforcement folks at the city level, both urban and rural? Is there, is there any outreach or connection with our cities, or how, how's that working for us? Well, primarily the NLP program is just through the sheriff's office. Obviously, okay. we provide service for Happy Valley, so a lot of these areas are within or really close to Happy Valley, so we do involve the city Happy Valley and their code enforcement as well. So we, we partner with them uh, if it applies to their city as well. Okay, but and the, commissioner the, there's no other formal outreach. I mean, if you're, like I said, you're contracted with Happy Valley, but you're like, you're not going to Canby, you're not going to Malala, you're not going I, to- I think there is, when we, when, we, when we learn of properties, I know we've worked with Malala, I know we've worked with uh, Sandy Police on some of these properties, so there certainly is coordination with local agencies. I would also, t kind of touching on that point in your prior point, uh, Statewide, we have presented uh, myself, Bill Stewart, uh, Michelle Amon. We've yeah. presented several times at state sheriff's office uh, conferences, at county council conferences. Uh, this I will be this spring presenting at the Oregon State Bar Government Law Section. Uh, so, and that'll be the second time I think that we've done that. So, Good. yeah, the, the, we we have shared this and we've worked. You know, we we've we've spread the news, and I think other agencies are are also uh, taking note. Well, taking looking at it and doing it. Thank you, because you guys yeah. do great work. Thank you, Commissioner Schrader, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I just want to just. Uh applaud all of you and uh, just share my experiences with this program. Um, Bill, I met you um, in 2010 at Overland Park Affair when you cleaned up that community and there was a celebration of the neighborhood. Wow. Took a neighborhood, frankly, uh, drug issues, crime, theft, everything else that comes along with that, which, you know, I, I'm going to make the statement here, pretty, well, almost just say it now. I would assume that probably when you close these things down, it, there's a return on investment because you're actually be able to catch these guys and shut down all the other things that are happening because these become hubs of yeah. crime. Yeah. Um, Michelle, great work. Um, uh, I see Sarah in the back. Great. We, we've done a lot of these projects together. Actually, I've been invited to sit with the community. Uh, I've made a lot of new friends actually from this <laughs> because they're so happy. They're so pleased because we have shut down a lot of crime. The Risley House is literally just a few minute walk from my house. Uh, when they left, Bill, and they shut down those people, the backpacks, they were, before they shut down and after they shut down, they were still walking down my street and walking over to the hawk shop or the, or the um, what they call it, there's another term for that. Pawn but shop. Yeah, the pawn shop. And so there's been, and again, the drug trafficking that goes with it, all the other stuff, the, the thefts, people's property, housing, I mean, you're able to, because that they're, they're feeding their habit, these become hubs, and I appreciate all the work. And uh, I've already got the one that was in the news that we worked on um, day, on day camp out in Fircrest or Sandy area. Music Music Camp Road music got camp a lot Road. of press. Yep. Yeah, that was a big one. That was in the news. I mean, we had the 
a great work. That took a lot. That was a very, and these are all complex, they're all very unique. The one we recently acted on uh, a little bit, I can't talk about it. We did it in an executive session, but the one in Estacada, Eagle Creek area, over there by the trail, es es uh, Escadero Trail. So this this is rural, I've got rural benefits and, and, um, and urban benefits. So I wanna just say that they never asked you all never asked for any resources or extra general fund to run this program, so I applaud you all for that. The only ask they ever came to us for was actually to implement the nuisance ordinance, and that was from the sheriff's office, in which we did that. So we passed policy and ordinance to where we could we could uh, operate this program. So I really really pleased. I do have one question um, related, you know, because a lot of this was in my area, uh, still is to some degree, and I know you're working on that. Um, graffiti, the broken window theory, um, how, what is the policy right now on that? Because I'm seeing things crop up, you know, and I drive by, I uh, live in the, on the McLaughlin 99E corridor. I know that 82nd Avenue and 99E are, you know, hot areas. Um, what is the policy? I'm seeing graffiti. I've got to talk to Dan about a property we own that he's, he manages that's got graffiti all over it. We have some properties um, the public does. What, what is the policy on that? Yeah, there, there's a graffiti ordinance, and Michelle can certainly speak to that. Michelle, would you please introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you. I am Michelle Amon. Good morning. Please talk directly into the Oh, yeah, the sorry. Phone. Michelle Amon. I am the code enforcement supervisor. We do have an ordinance for graffiti, and we are complaint-driven, so we need to have those called in by the concerned citizen, and we address each and every one of those, and we make sure that they're taken care of. We go back out and make sure that they're painted over and removed. And we also share that information with the sheriff's office, because they have um, an officer that works on graffiti, and they track each of those tags, so that if they do find who's making that tag, they can actually go after them for each one of the cases that we've had taken care of. Wow, right. Because so. it's essentially for them, and for that, whatever crime or activity they're in it's it's their marker it's, a, it's signage and i understand that you know i don't have any expertise in that area but i know that by getting in front of it and painting over it and re removing it you're we're improving um the, the community and reducing that crime in that area yeah they get notoriety for each one that they is out there they often will post them all over and try to get um, more fame for their graffiti mark and so by having those painted over they usually leave an area if it's one that will paint over them quickly, and they won't come back to those areas usually. Well, again, thank you. Great work. I applaud the work, and I'm also glad that you did this with your own resources in your department. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner West. Does the graffiti program include private property like a storefront or the side of a Walgreens or something? Do we work with the private companies to help clean up the graffiti, or is it just public um, structures? Everything. So Everything. even if it's your personal house and somebody's tagged it, we'd have to call you and tell you that we've got to get that taken care of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question for Lieutenant Killinger. Um, is it my, is am I correct that the officers or that do the LP program that's that's like that's part time work? There is no full time law enforcement to help with this. Yeah. Currently, we don't have anybody assigned full time to NLP. We have our deputies. Uh, there's three deputies specifically that are on the NLP team, but any deputy can be a part of it, and any deputy can bring a location to our uh, attention and also work it with us. So it's done as a collateral duty. Um, a lot of deputies will work uh, during their shift or on overtime uh, to address these problems. Do you see a need, um, as this program grows and is successful, to have uh, a full-time designated person for this, or one or two? Uh, it, yeah, it'd be great to have a full-time uh, NLP program deputies if we had the resources to do that for sure. Okay, thank you. Resources are always an issue, commissioners. That's why we're in the budget situation that we're in. Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, this is kind of a softball question, but as I listen to you speak and I realize that the model of this cooperation between, you know, unsiloed is great. What's your secret? Because it's really hard to get departments to do that sometimes. Sometimes it's swimming like through taffy. Okay, so what What do you, yeah, it's a, it's a softball point. Like what, how come you're so successful? Is it just because you like each other? You have fun? I mean, what? what's the what's the magic sauce you use? Well, I'll be kind of selfish. I think a big part of it is our deputies take pride in their agency and they take pride in their community. Um, without them out there actively working these properties, as uh, Mr. West saw, 
um, if the deputies aren't out there actively working these properties and want to clean them up because uh, the pride of the area they work, um, we'd be at a loss. So I think that's a huge part of it is the exceptional work of the deputies out there identifying these houses and actively working them and solving these problems um, as well as utilizing our other resources which are here as well. And just to, to piggyback on what Lieutenant said, I, th I think everybody that's working on NLP issues wants to be working on them and cares about them. Okay. So I think that's, that's as much of it as anything else, is that we all uh, want to make a difference and we have you know get great uh, reward from having the successes that we've had. So. And you like each other. Yeah. Accomplishment. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. I mean, I, I know that. That goes, but uh, yeah, I was just curious about that because uh, we would get, you know, I just keep thinking of the housing situation. We really, you know, been working hard to integrate placement with wraparound services, and you guys, like, I, I just wish we could get the magic pill so we could we could move that forward too. Uh, in a, and we are moving forward with it, quite frankly. Our human resources people do a great job. I I know that, but uh, you guys are like, wow. Hitting it out of the ballpark. It's amazing. Yep. Thanks. It's not amazing. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Uh, many people who might live next to a house like the Risley House, who want to take action and get it fixed, might have some reservations about reporting it and then having their identity reported to the inhabitants for fear of retribution, if someone wants to bring to your attention a problem house for you to investigate, could they expect to remain anonymous? Absolutely. We'll take an, we take anonymous complaints from people all the time. Okay, good. Okay. With, with code enforcement, I know that there's an actual, they, when they're accepting complaints, there's questions that are asked about, do you need to remain, <clears throat> remain anonymous? There's exceptions in the public records law that talk about safety uh, concerns and things like that. So yeah, there's, there's ways to, to try to keep that all private. Okay, good, thank you. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I, I just, in general, I just wanna uh, just share on that point or that question, Commissioner, is that yeah, there are some neighbors, a part of that community that are, they're, they're scared to death, and yet there's some that will actually take a role open up their home to, for these meetings. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be on the phone because they're always encouraged to call, call, call. And so, you know, it really brings an, like an ad hoc volunteer group together. And they actually, it builds community. And the fact, the other part is it takes what otherwise would be a dilapidated property after these things are done and closed out and it improves the neighborhood. They invest in the properties. And I even had uh, one gentleman who, his son lived here, had a business in Portland. He was so impressed by this that they, moved, they, they spent time to actually relocate the family and their business into Clackamas County. Good. Right. That's, awesome. yeah. that's, yeah. that's, another, that's a huge win because they had confidence in, in, they were in Portland. They had confidence in that we actually fixed problems, we actually did things, and that success played through. So it's just a win all the way around. So great work, folks. Well, thank Thanks. you all for coming today and making this presentation. It's an information-only uh, policy session, but I think it's very obvious from all the comments here today that this board supports your continued activity in this program. Go forward, be prosperous, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Gary? That is all for today, Chair Smith. Seeing no further business before this commission, we are adjourned.